Shereen is a wealth of knowledge on all aspects of sex therapy and uh, has a trauma and attachment focus with her clients here. Hi. Hi. So, like Douglas was saying, I took, uh, I did some training with Marilyn um, and just fell in love with the trauma egg. We were using it a little bit with our intensive outpatient um, clients who were coming in for sex addiction and love addiction. But when I took the, the course with her, it was like a real thing, um, I just really got this experience of getting it, you know, and having done the work myself with some other people in the room, I just felt like this is something that everyone could benefit from should you choose to use it. You're all coming from a different perspective of trauma, but um, in the bigger picture, anyone who's dealing with trauma, which is pretty much everybody, I mean, if you think about it, <laughs> could do a version of this and benefit from it. So I wanted to give you a little bit of information just on what it's for, how it works, and then kind of teach you an overview of it. If you want the full experience, go find Marilyn and uh, do the whole thing with her, because um, it really is worth it. She doesn't, she's usually in Russia, but sometimes she's here, so you can catch her. Um, What's your last name? Murray. So the, her name is Marilyn Murray. M-U-R-R-A-Y, and this is the Murray Method. The trauma egg is part of the Murray Method. There are, I think, four levels of this. Uh, I'm kind of one and a half levels in, but this, the, the main stuff is, the trauma egg itself is this first level, so uh, ready to tell you guys all about it. Um, so, let's see. Before I get started, I just want to give you a better idea of like what this is. It's it's a type of art, it's not art therapy. Art therapy is its own very special unit of certification. Um, but it does use some drawing and some art, and um, I'll be showing you some stuff. We, I have permission from somebody that uh, did the whole thing, and I'm going to put this stuff up on the board so that you can see the steps of this. It starts with the trauma egg, and it then moves into the feelings around the traumas, <coughs> and then drawing the children that are within each person. Um, off the top of my head, those children are the sobbing child, the controlling child, and we'll go over this again so you don't need to remember all this, the angry, rebellious child, the uh, stubborn, selfish child, <coughs> the original child, and then finally the healthy, balanced person, which is what you want to be in the end of this process, hopefully. Excuse me. So, I'm going to first talk about the egg itself, and in order to do that, I'm actually going to put this on the board. Take me a minute to. Is that straight-ish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this may not work exactly like that. Stand by. <laughs> Okay. Can everybody kind of see it? I mean, you don't have to. We can't read it. Read it. You don't have to read it. <laughs> you don't have to read it as long as you see that it's up here, and you're welcome to look at it um, later, because we'll leave this stuff up here. It is not straight, is it? Um, <clears throat> so the f the first thing about the egg is that when you when a person starts this process, you just hand them this big piece of paper, and it's blank, and you say, okay, we're gonna we're going to be doing the trauma egg. And I'd like you to draw a big egg on your page. So they start with just drawing a big egg. Almost always the person will be like, I can't draw. I don't know how to do this. How big should it be? I'm not an artist. What, do I, what am I supposed to do? And there's a lot of sort of anxiety that comes up. And that's really normal. And you just normalize it and let them do what they need to do. If someone draws a tiny egg, I ask them to redo it. If it's too big or too small, <clears throat> um, but still big enough to do the work, I might just let them leave it as is because it's not about perfection. So the first thing that I say is that, okay, well, the egg is kind of you. This is you when you were born. So I'm going to ask you, I say, to put your birth date at the bottom. And they do that. And then I ask them, okay, what about what was going on in the world or in your society, your community, when you were born? So this person, 1970, um, 
Vietnam War, Kent State, and they were born on July 14th, Bastille Day. So they wrote all that down. Then after they write that, you ask them, now do you know if your mother had any stillbirths or miscarriages before you were born? Or if she had any <coughs> children who did not make it for one reason or another who passed away? And that would go down there as well. After they have that, you ask them to, on the left outside bottom, start writing things about mom. And those things would be youngest of five kids. Dad was an alcoholic. Mom was mean. Um, and this is all stuff that would be going on, like what mom's life was like when the child was born. So this wouldn't be stuff since this person was born. It would be, you know, up through about July 1970, what can they tell us about their mother? So this person wrote, only girl, four brothers, histrionic mother, nice dad, molested by two uncles, maternal uncles, um, impulsive, hard to read, emotional, maybe BPD, um, father shot in 81, father died of prostate cancer, um, I'm going to skip that one, uh, first got married at age 15, um, this person is actually from, this family is Iranian, um, and there are a few more things that mom wrote, or that had to do with mother here. Hard worker, pushed kids to succeed, parentified the kids, very beautiful, and a lot of boundary problems. So that's what they did with mom. Over here, same kind of thing with dad. Oldest of six, four boys, two girls. Father died, um, this is father's father died in 1977 from a reserved family, workaholic, well-liked, nice, old school, controlling, but also too accommodating, financially generous, boundary problems, absent a lot, and they bonded with sports. So this is everything that this person was born into. And when you're doing the trauma egg, the way that Marilyn likes to say it, and I really like to say it, is that this is the nest that they were born into. This is what's holding them. So right now, at this point in the process, we have a big blank egg and a nest that it's sitting on. And then I start telling them what we're actually doing here, which is we're gonna start listing the traumas. The way the traumas get listed, the way this person did it was actually color-coded. That doesn't have to be the way it is, but I find it kind of cool to see how people do it. But you start with the earliest trauma that happened. And chronologically, you just keep going until today. Now, some people's egg is one egg. Some people, like this one, there are six or seven. I'm not going to put them all up on the board. The board's not big enough for that, actually. Um, but I'm happy to show it to you guys if you feel like you want to see that. They're all about this full. So the person starts drawing. And the way that they do it is that the, you'll see, you can probably <coughs> kind of see it from the back. The lines, they're different colors, but they're also different thicknesses. So like a thinner line or a dotted line means that the intensity of the traumatic event was not as big. The thicker the line is, the, the more intense the event is. So let's see, this person down here, uh, dad gets on a plane with sister, age three. On this egg, we have the biggest, thickest line. Um, I don't know, do you guys want to actually know what some of these yeah. are? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so these are pretty, some of them are pretty intense. Um, the first one, which wasn't a huge deal, but for this person was considered a trauma. Sister was born when this, this gal was uh, two and a half. Dad gets on a plane with sister, age three. Saw sister's dead mangled rabbit, age five. Saw my do dog get run over by a car, age five. Lost two weeks of time and considered it her fault. Age five, fell in parent's car, cut head open, went to the hospital. Age six, was bouncing on a bed, fell and blacked out, woke up to paramedics. Age six, <coughs> excuse me, my voice. Um, 
parents separated. And then we start with the green stuff, which I guess is more the sexual traumas. Saw a man at day camp park masturbating with no pants, grinning at me, age seven. Car accident with mom, taken to hospital, age seven. Boy at school grabbed my breast, several inappropriate incidents, age seven. Food poisoning in hospital, age seven. Paternal grandmother mean to me at grandfather's funeral, age seven. Arab bus driver, uh, that was in Israel, uh, followed me and mom, tried to bust into hotel room, age seven. Fell into an aqueduct in Tehran, age seven. It's a big year. Yeah. And then we go into age eight. Um, friend's mom shot herself, age eight. Almost drowned in Hawaii, swam out too far, age eight. Mom made me do Scientology, age eight to 10. Mom naked screaming at boyfriend, throwing his stuff outside, age eight, nine. Mom and I and sister walked in on a burglar, age nine. Started developing breasts, I think is what that says, age eight to nine. Thrown off a horse um, at a dude ranch, owner abused the horse, the horse, uh, but anyway, she broke her ankle, age 10. So that, that was in purple, so it was a, a big event then? Um, the purple, I think, represents physical injuries. Well, I meant the line. The but the line. thickness yeah. of the line, yeah. The, that was a bigger event. Um, in this case, didn't, so that was age 10, didn't go to doctor till age 12. Um, cast for six months and then stopped liking sports as a result. Mm -hmm. Stop liking sports. Um, pack of motorcycle riders almost ran over us at a sleepover camp, age 10. Boy at Sunday school intentionally pushed me down the stairs, blacked out, age 10. Saw dissected screaming looking cats before a piano recital, age 10. Mm -hmm. Um, teacher verbally and physically abusive to me, sixth grade, age 10. Maternal grandfather shot in arm at his liquor store, age 11. Wiped out badly while skiing, age 11. Pneumonia, age 12. And then another trauma, it uh, looks like orange is sister related, was told I had to watch over sister, age 12. May I ask, the ones on the outside, are those yes. ones she had forgotten to put? or? Yeah, so the ones on the outside, this was um, something I was gonna do later, but we'll do it now. It's actually chronic stressors and chronic events. All of the stuff in the egg is typically kind of single events, more or less. Stuff on the outside is long-term event, uh, long-term stressors. So on the outside, we have bullied my sister and vice versa, age 10 to 13. Bullied at school, age 8 to 13, and more. Lots of anti-Semitic and anti-Persian racism. Mom critical of my looks and body. Parents repeatedly hours late to pick me up from school, sometimes completely forgot. Ugly duckling, age 8 to 13. And then father's corporal punishment, age 5 to 10, spanking me upside down bottoms of feet, belt on feet or butt. So this is through about age 12 for this person. And I wanted to kind of ask you guys, what, and feel free to speak up, when you see this, what do you see? What patterns do you see? What comes up for you? Countertransference <laughs> wise and otherwise. Feel for anyone who wants to say something. Well, it seems like she wasn't very protective. The parents mm -hmm. were protective. I mean, how could she be subjected to all those different things? Yeah. Accidents, falling in this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, getting food poisoning in the hospital. I mean, it just seems like where were her parents? And then her father was absolutely was brutal. I mean, punishing her. Mm -hmm. Her mother screaming at her boyfriend. So mm -hmm. the whole atmosphere was toxic, I think. Yeah, and you might, as the therapist doing this, you might say, you know, here's what I'm noticing. It looks like your parents were um, more into whatever else they were doing than they were into taking care of you or looking out for your well-being. Um, and then you might ask them, how does that feel? To, does that seem true? And they might, they probably would say, mm-hmm. 
and then you can kind of go with that a little bit more and say, well, how does that feel to you? What do you think about that? And you get to process it. And you usually, by the way, you do all the eggs and then you go over it and process it. Mm -hmm. Would it help you guys to see other the other eggs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, give me a moment while I. Do you always do it on this size of paper? Pardon? Do you always do it on this size of paper? Uh, yeah. You want to give it as much space as possible. Marilyn actually does it. Um, she actually does it on butcher paper. So she will she will put a whole like start to roll a butcher paper here and then just let it roll down and down and they can just they start from age zero here and they just keep writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. Oh, so they start at the top. They for for them they start at the top partly because um, in Russia they just don't have a lot of options. Yeah. You know? Yes. The first the Saul father and sister on plane age three, that seems to be a big trauma for her, correct? Mm -hmm. If in where I sit, I'm unclear, would it be okay to, for, could, could you expand it? Like the other ones were clear to me, I'm unclear about that, so would you ask about that? You would. Okay. In any, you would ask about anything at all that you're unclear about. All right. And you would just say, so tell me a little bit more about this event. All right. And what I noticed for most people is that they, they, they tend to not go into a dysregulated state doing this. There's actually a bit of dissociation happening mm -hmm. because they're just like, oh my God, this stuff happened, and they write it. So they're, they're a little bit in a more of a left brain thing. They're able to talk about what happened. Um, it's when you start processing that they kind of drop into the, the feelings more. And that's kind of okay, right. you know. Um, I think you were... Is it always in written form? Um, in my, uh, no, it's my not. courses, it was um, pictures, and they had drawn out pictures and then segregated mm -hmm. That's what I learned. Yeah. So, um, for those of you who know who Patrick Carnes is, mm -hmm. um, he is the sort of father of sex addiction work. He wrote Out of the Shadows. He adapted the trauma egg. And the way that he decided to adapt it, and I do both ways, but I find that this way is actually more uh, time efficient, um, is that he would have them draw, like draw a little, uh, so if this is the egg and they're drawing a little image, um, they would draw like, okay, I went to a church and this terrible thing happened at church, and they might draw like a cross and somebody angry at them or something. And then they would draw a little bubble over it and around it. Um, you might not be able to see it that well, but okay, so like here would be the image that they draw, and then they would draw a bubble. And then here's another image they would draw, and they would draw another bubble. And so that taps in a little bit more to the right brain. Um, it also just moves a lot slower. So for us in the work that we do here, because uh, we're tending to use it for intensive patients, we want to get as much as possible in there. But you can do it either way. Um, yes. Are you are clients um, doing this on the spot, or are they? I mean, I I see that some lines look like they were maybe inserted later, but I would mm -hmm. think that you know um, a lot of stuff would be coming up ira out of order. And is this is this a, a after having like done a draft to themselves to figure out what they're going to put, or are these people? Is, is it a reflection of people having? Told their trauma story to themselves enough that they are just, you know, they they know A B C D E F. I think it's a combination, um, and it really depends. You have to assess your own client and see what is best for them. This person um, uh, did it in such a way where she had already, because she had done so much trauma work, she had an Excel document with all of her traumas. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, What's that? I said, just joking. She's a therapist. That's my feeling. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, but she so, know in advance so, she was going to need six eggs to do her whole. No, she thing. she didn't know. She, I mean, no one really knows what's going to happen. But, you know, the the part of this process is that for her, she had the Excel document. So when she was assigned this, she was able to go home and like put in what she thought, and then go back and say, oh crap, I forgot this thing, that thing, this thing you know, that thing, that thing, that thing, and so added it in later. For clients who are, um, 
are able to self-regulate, I think that's okay. For clients who have difficulty self-regulating, I would not send them home with an assignment of writing out their traumas in advance, mm -hmm. um, because we want to be able to like contain them as they leave and not go home and spin out. It's very tricky, and you have to kind of use your own intuition to do it. This is a fluid process. It's not like etched in stone in any way. Yes? OK, I have a question. She put down, she got her period or something? Mm -hmm. Rest. 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 OK. <clears throat> so how do you determine you know, what traumas? I mean, you could say, I went to a new school. That's a trauma. Or I started mm -hmm. seventh grade. <clears throat> you know, about breast, or is everything a trauma? I mean, we all have changes that are maybe a little difficult and move to a new city, but are they really traumas? So, well, we're, we're hoping that when we give the instructions, we're, we're clarifying what a trauma means. Um, so what I say typically is, it's not every time you stub your toe, or you know, every time you trip in front of the boy you liked, or whatever. Um, it's things that feel significantly traumatic to you. Okay. And that could that means things that are hurtful, um, that make you angry, embarrassed, ashamed, fearful. Uh, you know, you can list a bunch of negative feelings and say anything that made you feel like that that seems traumatic. That could be small t, big t, and I explain what that means oh, yeah, to them. Right. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. I mean, I what, if you, what if you have someone who's pretty emotionally shut down? So a lot of those things maybe it was a little t, but they didn't. They just like blocked it out, and so really they don't have a lot of traumas on there because they dismiss a lot of. Them. Mm -hmm. What I might say with a person like that, if they're willing to do the exercise at all, because they might not be, but if they're willing to do it, I say, okay, well, this might be a, a ongoing process. Let's just start where you are. Just write whatever you got, and we process that. And but in the in the course of processing that, a lot of times more things start to come up, something cracks open, and we, we might say, well, I might say, let me hold on to the egg here, and whenever we come in and we recognize that there's another trauma that has kind of come to light, let's just add it. I'll have you add it at that time. Mm -hmm. So again, being fluid about it, meeting them where they are, um, not necessarily pushing them, processing as much as possible, but going at a pace that feels both safe and just a little past safe, you know, a little pushing, gently. So yeah. what are the criteria that make you decide it's the right time and the right person to introduce this to? Well, for me, because we work at a place where, like this, right. you know, people coming in here tend to know that they're going to actually be addressing these things. But um, when I use it in my private practice, what I might say, or what I might think first is, okay, well, what kind of ego strength does this person have? If they have what I deem to be enough ego strength to, to do this, then I might just suggest it to them. You know, there's this thing, we keep getting your traumas in dribs and drabs, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you would be interested in kind of unpacking this at a different pace using some drawing and illustrating. <coughs> and they'll be like, well, what the hell are you talking about? And I'll say, well, this is what I mean, and I might give them a handout that sort of explains it. And um, sometimes they get to tell me I don't want to do this, and I'm like, all right. But we'll, we'll, I, and I might say, well, well, we'll try this again. Let's see in a few months. Maybe you'll feel differently. But we as clinicians have to kind of see intuitively and also clinically, does this person seem like they kind of want to talk about this stuff, mm -hmm. that they're willing to talk about it, that they're itching to talk about it? Or am I just going to hit a big wall every time I even start? Yeah. I have a client that I keep trying to sort of do this kind of work mm -hmm. with. And she starts getting so triggered, it affects every single area of mm -hmm. her life. And so how do you deal with someone that, like, but what's interesting about her is she's very positive and does a good job to take care of herself. Mm -hmm. But then when it, like, when we go into her trauma, it's very hard for her to re-regulate. I might teach her some skill, re-regulation skills, before even going there. Um, I have, okay. and she has plenty of skills, and, and she she's still, just, so like, her mood gets, she'll get really, really depressed, and, like, her OCD stuff will start coming out again, and, you know? That's a tough one. I would probably have to meet her to really know what to do with that. Um, I, I probably would give her a... Uh, put some of the onus on her a little bit to say, well, what do you think you need? 
right. you know, you've probably done that already, yeah. but, you know, to really start to say, I, I, I get that you want to go there. I get that you want to open up, but this thing keeps happening. How can we make sure that you're okay, that you can recognize that even though you're, maybe you're feeling depressed when you leave, maybe it really bums you out, that you can be okay with the fact that we're actually just starting the process of healing it. Mm -hmm. And in, in bringing it up in almost like a homeopathic way, we're going to be healing it. And maybe what we do is we just start with zero to five or um, a certain type of trauma. So we can have her do it, but like leave big spaces, just the things that she thinks she's willing and able to talk about without getting dysregulated. So like you, you find different ways to do it, but giving her some space to sort of choose her own path. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I, what I imagine, I, I mean, I have no idea, I have not met this person obviously, but um, is that there's a part of her that feels like, like stuff's about to happen to her, you know, that she's at the effect of the world again. And maybe <coughs> somewhere in there um, is kind of getting her to a place of ownership of herself instead of victim. Okay. I don't know. It's just off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah. Um, obviously, after you give the spiel about like what a trauma is to the client, I assume that when they tell you anything or when they write something down, you obviously don't really question it. You don't like, well, was that really traumatic? But is there, are there any circumstances where you would actually t talk to a client about whether to put something on before actually putting it on? Maybe if you have a client with bi um, borderline personality disorder or somebody that's just highly activated by everything because of more significant traumas that everything feels like a trauma now. I'm just wondering about the process of putting something on. Yeah, so let me first say that when someone presents with a sort of feel of access to, I might be a little more hesitant to do this, mm -hmm. I, I think for obvious reasons. Okay. Um, but if, if that's less of what we're talking about or it's sort of a mild access to thing where I feel like, okay, they could probably handle this, um, I let them do what they feel is traumatic because it's really, it's about what they're carrying as trauma, it's not about what the rest of the world thinks is trauma. Later we could look at it and sort of do a sort of CBT process around, you know, like a cognitive, hey, so when you think about yourself and the world around you, how does, how do you feel like you fit into that world with everything that happened? You can just open up that dialogue, but this is really about whatever it is that they consider to be traumatic. It's just that, you know. Um, I've heard a lot of stuff that's so random sounding, but, you know, things like, um, you know, throwing a glass at somebody felt traumatic to them, um, but wouldn't have been traumatic to another person, you know, so you just have to kind of go with that person's thing, whatever that is. So I'm going to um, keep going uh, as best I can with this. Oh, yes. Do you have, um, how much guidance are you giving as far as, like, this color coding? Is that something that, that they did on their own, or is that part of the process? This person, um, she, she decided to do it on her own, and... Um, when I'm telling people how to do it, I say, you know, you can do whatever you want. You can use whatever colors you want. I'd rather you don't use black unless it seems really important that you use black, like it seems relevant to the trauma. Um, but otherwise, like, feel free to be as colorful or monochromatic as you want to be. And that's really, again, it's meeting them where they are mm -hmm. as much as possible. That's great. This is markers, yeah. We have here, we use markers, crayons, we offer markers, crayons, um, and colored pencils. Yeah. Did you say that you process one egg at a time? Um, we process all the eggs at once. Okay. <laughs> and and so, so what we do, they finish all the eggs, and then we put them up on the wall, mm -hmm. and we ask them to step back and look at all of them and share what they're feeling when they look at everything. Mm -hmm. And there's often a lot of tears, mm -hmm. a lot of anger, mm -hmm. um, but doing it all at once allows for the bigger picture of what just what's happened to them, what they've been carrying. Um, just to add a little bit to that, once all the eggs are done and they're looking at them, I often, depending on the person I'm sitting with, I might say, so remember when we started, you were just this open, blank baby that came into the world on the nest that you started with, but it was just you and you were blank slate. All this stuff happened to you and around you. 
and it changed who you were. And we want to get you back to who you originally were. So you are not your traumas, but it feels like that right now. When you look at this, you probably feel so overwhelmed by it. But we want to get you to a place where that's not the case anymore. You can go back to the original child that you were born to be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And they say, how? <laughs> and we, I say, well, patience grasshopper, we will get there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sounds like more, um, a lot of clients have more than one egg then. It's not just an exception. Um, two is sort of the average of what I, the norm of what I see. Um, partly I think because uh, if I don't give them preparation time, they're just, whatever they remember is what comes up. This, if everybody got to take this assignment home and say, uh, let's make your Excel document or whatever first, they probably would have maybe three ish. Yeah. But the Sunday often, the Sunday workshop they're offering is four hours. But generally with people, how long do you take? Weeks, the, I mean months? The, the egg itself really is based on the pace that they need. Okay. Um, when we have an IOP person, someone come in for our intensive program, we just have a, a handful of hours for the egg itself, and then we have other hours for the children that come after the egg, the ones that I talked about at the beginning. Oh, okay. So it, it ends up being somewhere between six and eight hours okay. total for the whole process. Yes? What's the reason that you don't encourage the clients to use black marker? Um, I personally find it to be a cop-out. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of times people just go, oh, and they just pick up black and just do it, and so I, I don't want them to do that. I think the colors um, tap into like a more child state and a more sort of right brain state because it's artistic and it, it just asks them to, to dive into a deeper part of themselves to do it. I think black is um, too simple and clinical. But I do tell them if you feel that black is relevant, use it. I just don't want you to just use black. So when you, you know, suggest that mm -hmm. when clients decide to use black mm -hmm. among all that colors, mm -hmm. could that be more significant trauma when they decide to pick up black? It can be. I mean, you can ask them. You know, what made you decide to use black in that moment for this particular trauma? And they might say, I don't know, I was just really angry, you know. Or they might say, um, this was an awful thing that happened. You know, no, I think you were next. Can, is this a, a technique that you can use within a 15 minute session, or do you really need to do something that's more of a intensive or a workshop? Or I feel that probably giving it more time and space is better. Yeah. I think there are like many versions of this you could probably adapt for yourself. Because um, you, it seems like breaking it over two sessions might not be the best. Mm -hmm. Well, with this <laughs> level of trauma, I don't think so at all. Right. <laughs> this is, I mean, I'm, I work with clients that have had a lot of trauma, and mm -hmm. I'm just shocked reading this. I feel like depending on how much trauma they've experienced. Mm -hmm. This person did it overnight. So this person was given, um, because she had the whole Excel thing already, um, she was, she said, yeah, I'll, I'll take it home and do it, fuck it, you know, mm -hmm. and um, went, did it, it took, she said about uh, four hours, she came back and she had all six and a half of these eggs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so, interesting, and do you ever find that people are addicted to their narrative? They are so <coughs> identifying with the trauma in their lives that they're completely resistant to going back to the baby that they used to be, because they don't... Sure, I, I think that, that people can be addicted to their traumas or anything, you know, it's, it, their, their story is the thing that, that has given them identity all this time, you know, and we don't necessarily want to take that away from them until there's some other self to turn to. Mm -hmm. um, but for somebody like this and for quite a few of the people, it's either they're really attached to their traumas and they've been talking and talking and talking and talking, or they've been super resistant. And this is more like cracking it open, you know. And then there's a whole spectrum in between, obviously. So, I had a question. Oh, you were. Well, there's y'all, um, you and someone else here said big T, little T. What does that mean? Yeah. So, um, just looking at it in terms of like this, the type of trauma, the size of trauma. Like a big T trauma might be like you were in a war, or somebody died, or there was a really violent car accident, or uh, severe abuse 
things that are big deals. A little T trauma might be, um, you know, a, a concussion that you were fine. Um, like, I mean, you can pick things like small T, meaning that um, it's not as big of a deal to you. But it still makes it on there. It still makes it on there. If it feels like a trauma to them, it's a trauma. Okay. Big or small. And as the client is <coughs> doing this, do you let them decide whether they want to then talk about the, give you the, the narrative of the each specific one that you may not have already heard them talk about? Or do you give them guidance as to wanting them to, to get them all down rather than, you know, giving the backstory of each one? Um, it depends, I think, on, this, in, on in the way that you're doing it. Like if you're doing it over time or in, in a single sitting. but. For this person, um, the, at the end of it, it was the question was asked. Okay, so what would you like to tell me about this egg? Like, would you want to tell me everything? Do you want to tell me little bits of it? Do you? How would you like to approach this? What are your feelings about it? And you just kind of let them do it their way. But it sounds then like while they're constructing the egg, you discourage or you don't encourage them to I elaborate them to, just to get it. Down. I ask them to get it down, and then uh -huh. we talk about it at the end. Uh -huh. So I'm going to keep going with this. I'm not going to do all six and a half because we'll be here for hours. Um, so chronically, um, we have a whole lot of fighting with both parents, rebellion and independence, and we have miscellaneous smaller sexual assaults and offenders, masturbators, etc. that didn't go on the egg because there was a number of them and this person decided to not list every single thing that had happened. Um, but did list, uncle sexually inappropriate, dad dismissed it when I told him, age 11 to 15. Ran away from home, man tried to abduct me, age 13. Watched KGB beat up two guys for talking to us in Kiev, age 15. Dad slammed me into a wall to protect mom, age 15. Had mono, age 16. First car accident, age 16. Um, boyfriend threatened suicide if I left him, age 15. First car break-in, stuff stolen, age 17. Witness bad accident, age 17. Second car accident with a drunk driver, totaled car, age 17. Anonymous guy digitally sexually assaulted me at a punk rock show, pit, age 17. Um, almost <coughs> carjacked, guy broke window with bat, cops not helpful, age 18. Friend Danny died in car accident, age 18. Guy tried to sexually assault me on Halloween in WeHo. Okay, age 18. <laughs> Fainted at dad's wedding. Um, stepmom angry at me because thought it was intentional, age 18. Fainted at a bank, age 18. Another car break in, age 18. Fainted at a travel agency, age 18. Italian man tried to sexually assault me while I slept with other backpackers outside train station, age 19. Let a friend's friend crash at my place, visitor from Germany woke up to him sucking my toes, age 19. Another car break in, age 19. Jealous ex-boyfriend stalked me with gun, age 19. Guy I was sleeping with gave me first cocaine, age 19. Crazy homeless guy tried to strangle me, got away. Cops watched it and did nothing, age 19. Abortion number one, painful, age 20. Maternal grandfather died of prostate cancer five minutes after I left hospital, age 20. Sister's ex-boyfriend, who I loved like a brother, OD'd on heroin, age 20. Almost got arrested by aggressive cops because had a wild party, age 20. Boyfriend's two best friends executed by gunshot, age 20. Good friend suicided, OD'd, traumatic body viewing, age 20. Saw a child fall from roof past my apartment window, died, age 20. Girlfriend's suicide attempt, blamed me, age 21. What are your thoughts about that? What kind of neighborhood or something she was in? Um, is that US? This, this gal lived on the west side. So a lot of the stuff happened. She, she, when she was a kid, she lived in Santa Monica. 
Encino, West Hollywood, and Beverly Hills. Those were the three, four places that this all happened. Yeah. To clarify, do you, you look for patterns mm -hmm. rather than going into each? Both. Mm -hmm. Both. So I would ask her, like this guy, this guy, this thing um, pops out because she did a big thick line. So I would uh, say, I yeah. let's talk about the ones that were more traumatic, I or see. you tell me which ones you want to uh -huh. talk about. Okay. But the bigger picture of it after she presents it is me saying to her, um, wow, you've had a lot of physical injury, you were not safe in your body, etc. whatever it is that my interpretation is. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts looking at all this? I'm mm -hmm. just curious to get on into the kid, the, the all yes. these children. Yeah, we're figures. gonna do that now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else with there's much more blaming her in this age than the previous age. There's much more blaming, blaming her of her by like other people. Or, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say that's her. It's one of her experiences. Okay. Any other thoughts on the egg itself? Just remembering that this is a process that can be as long or as short as it needs to be, and. Um, we're going, we're kind of just tracking them as best we can. Um, to move on to the kids, but we first have to do one last step with this, which is that after all of this is done, we go back and we ask them to write the feelings. This is not something that happened with this particular egg, but to write the feelings that the child felt while this stuff, each of these things was happening. So that would look like going, looking at each event and we give them a feelings list, anger, pain, embarrassment, a, a big long feelings list. And we say, go ahead and, you know, say what you need to say about the feelings that you felt. And then they say, what if I didn't know what I felt? You say, well, what do you think that child would have felt? Or your inner child would have felt when, um, when these things were happening? And so they just go through and they would put the feelings on usually this side. So I tend to have the chronic stuff over here and the feelings over here. And when we go through and we do the whole looking at it at the end, I include in my looking for patterns, I include the feelings. So I might say, wow, it seems like the main, one of the main things you kept feeling repeatedly was um, abandoned or um, devalued or unprotected or whatever it is. Does that make sense? Let me just get this all off. Any questions about the feelings part? Yeah. I just had a question about the paperwork in general. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. it looks like you have the copy of their work. Would you not want them to keep that or ever send it home with them? Um, what we do here is we ask them if they would like to keep it. And if they do, they can do that. If they don't want to keep it, um, we ask them if we would, if they would like us to shred it, um, and if they say uh, yes, then we shred it. We also ask, is it okay if we use this for teaching? And if they say that's fine, then they sign a release, and we can use it for teaching. But you get to ask if you're using this in your private practice. You ask what you, whatever you need to ask. Any other questions? Yeah. And you, if you keep it for them, you have to keep it for seven years. Yeah. We have a whole system set up. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So for each of those lines, if the person is willing, they would put the feeling next to each. Mm -hmm. Or drama. feelings, yeah. Feelings. Yeah. yeah. So again, that would just go on one side. Usually it's at the, I put it on the right just because it's, okay, and, and then this was the feeling that I had. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about stuff so far? Okay. So... So the next thing that we do once that is happened, has happened is that we start talking about the pool of pain that these feelings have generated in them. Pool of pain is essentially a way to say, wow, all of those feelings, where do they go? And what we tell them is, where they go is into your sobbing child. That's basically your heart. That's the like the heart part of you, the soft, emotional part of you that is just trying to navigate all of this, you know? Sobbing child. 
And I'm just trying to find that drawing. So give me one sec. Should have helped if I put this in order. Um, all right, well, I can't find it. So <laughs> there are a lot of pieces of paper here. So, but what, what the sobbing child is, is basically what we have them draw is we say, okay, I'd like you to draw your sobbing child, and they say, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and we say, you know, it's the part of you that had to survive all of this stuff. It's the part of you that has all the emotions about it. I can't believe I don't have this one. That's so depressing. Um, if I find it later, I'll show it to you. And so what somebody might draw, um, if I remember correctly, actually, what this person draw, drew was, like if this was the, the paper, she drew this little person sitting here, like really sad, in a, um, like kind of just like trying to be in this corner. And all this other stuff was happening, she, stuff that she drew about life and the world and whatever it was, and she was in this little tiny corner, barely anything. Um, and once they, once they draw that, we process that. So each of the kids we process as it happens. We give them the instructions and then give them usually 20 minutes, maybe half an hour depending on the person. And we just say, okay, draw your sobbing child. What does that mean? means whatever you want it to mean. Most people draw an actual child of some kind in some kind of a setting, but you don't have to do that. Whatever the thought of where you keep all of your sad, painful, angry, fearful emotions, that part of you, wherever you keep that, draw that. Draw that child part of yourself, even if it doesn't look literally like a child. And we just process it. So the idea here is to Put a spotlight on it, put attention on There's this part of you that's carrying your pain. And it's so burdened. And I mean, a pool of pain, when I think of that, it just seems so like dark and heavy and sad. And I might say that to my client, what, depending on what they draw, especially. Like this one, I might say, oh my gosh, she's so alone. You just reflect. I mean, we all do that, right? We just reflect what we see. She's so alone, and what's all this over here? And she explains it. And I might say, oh my god, but look how far away she is from all of that stuff in this tiny corner. How does she feel? Like, tell me about how she's feeling. And oftentimes there are tears, you know, and that's good, typically, mostly, depending on the client. So if we're doing this right, we're just containing, we're holding, we're listening, we're being there, we're, we're giving empathy, we're seeing them finally. I had another, another client um, drew something like, there's a bed, I think, and it was, there was a clock on the wall and there was art. It was her mother's bedroom and she drew herself basically down at the bottom on the floor. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna pretend I'm drawing. And I asked her, okay, well, what are you, what's, what is this? What's happening here? She said, well, this is my mother's bedroom, and this is right after she beat the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. And this is usually where I would stay after that happened. She always did it in her bedroom, and she always left me there and left the room. And I felt, and I asked her, well, how did you feel about that? And she said, oh, I felt abandoned, but I also felt like part of her still. It's like this way to still connect to her, I guess that I got to still stay in her room. And I mean, that actually made me cry when I heard that, I was really, that was moving, I thought. And I also, by the way, I do let my feelings show a little bit because I think it's important for them to have a real experience of not only empathy, but just being reflected and seen. So that was that one. We've had all sorts of things. I mean, some people will just draw you know, some people will just kind of go like this. They'll take a marker and they'll just be like, this is my pool of pain. And they'll just keep scribbling and scribbling and scribbling until I say stop. Because that's what it feels like. Some people will draw a drop of like one tear. So it doesn't matter what they draw. It's whatever they feel that they need to draw, but we process it with them because we're trying to 
make the unconscious conscious. We're trying to bring this stuff out and help them get seen. And it, it's, this is, I think, one of the hardest ones to do because it is where all the emotions are. Um, any questions about the sobbing child? Seems pretty self-explanatory. You asked oh. them to draw the sobbing child, not the pool of pain, right? Correct. Because the sobbing child contains the pool of pain. But isn't the, the sobbing child going to be many sobbing children? It like could be a sobbing child for every day of their life if you wanted it to be. Event. But it could yeah. be an event. It could be whatever. It could be anything they want it to be, but it, it holds all of the feelings they've been walking around with. So the idea is within the body of this child, of this being that's in front of us, is a part of them that's holding all of these feelings that have happened day after day, year after year. And that child is like exhausted by the time we get them. But when they finish the sobbing child, you empathize, you mm -hmm. process it, et cetera, how do they they often feel seen. And, you know, remembering that this is a process, not an event, um, we're giving them this opportunity to start shifting. Okay. So there's no magic pill or magic switch, but this is sort of, I see your trauma, I see what you've had to deal with, and now we're going to talk about you from this perspective of having laid this all out in the open and letting me witness it. <coughs> So this is basically like an externalization of all of the sadness yeah. that they've had in their whole entire yeah. life. So they can actually <clears throat> feel it and have empathy for it. So it's not them. Yeah, yeah, it is. So along, sort of along those lines, the next child that we draw is the controlling child. The controlling child is the child that helped this person cope and not just be in a, in a pool of pain their whole lives. So the controlling child, I'm going to read actually Marilyn's thing because I really like it. It's the innate defense mechanism created out of the strengths of the original child to protect the sobbing child. Your controlling child will use whatever he or she can out of your innate, ab innate abilities or out of your environment to hold down your pain. Some of the most common defenses the controlling child uses are repression, anesthetizing, like with food, alcohol, drugs, sex, tobacco, and diversionary tactics like relationships, school, work, church, sports, music, reading, computers, etc., caretaking, sleep. As a defense mechanism, your controlling child is meant to be temporary help in time of pain and distress. In addition to being your defense mechanism, your controlling child also keeps you responsible and helps you set healthy boundaries keeps others from victimizing you, and keeps you from victimizing others. So the controlling child is basically, like I said, the part of the person that learns to cope with all the trauma and all the pain that, that the trauma caused. It is absolutely important that we all have a controlling child, just like it's important that we ha all have an emotional sobbing child that holds our feelings but we don't want them to be dominating our lives. And that's what we say to the, our client as well. That we don't want them to be living from a place of the sobbing child or the controlling child. We want them to be the original child, the healthy, balanced person, which I'll get to shortly. And from that perspective, showing them that they can actually stop like working so hard. You know, we can let go of some of this. I've got your back. You don't have to be doing these things anymore. You don't have to use the same coping skills you used when all of those things were happening. Now you're an adult at age whatever, let's say it's an adult, or you're a 17 year old, or you're whatever age you are. Maybe some of the stuff we can start letting go of or giving it a, a, a place, like a shelf to put it on for when you need it again, but not walking around in that state all the time. Does that make sense? <coughs> so, what Marilyn talks about when she talks about the healthy, balanced person is that there will be, I don't know, there will be the original child, here, I'm not going to make this pretty, and the sobbing child is kind of here, and the controlling child is there. When we get people, usually, the sobbing child or the controlling child, are the, or both, are huge, but that's not what we want. 
we want them to go back to their original state as much as possible while being realistic because we live in a society that you can't just be this baby anymore. That looks kind of funny. Um, <laughs> who wants to interpret that? No. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, let's just erase that. Let's do this Cracking myself up. <laughs> okay. The next two children um, we do in order as much as possible. It's the angry, rebellious child and the stubborn, selfish child. So let me pull them out first. And I'm just going to read them to you. The angry, rebellious child is actually the, the simplest one, I think. This is the overtly hostile part of them. It resembles two electrical live wires connecting. Aggressive, demanding, stubborn, blows up quickly. Don't tell me what to do. I don't care what you think. I'll do it my way. This is one that you can use with adolescents. You know, anyone who's worked with adolescents, you can imagine this is something that they live in a lot. Um, but you ask them to draw that, and they could, uh, actually, let me see if I can find that real quick for this person. Yeah. So, this was her angry, rebellious child. So, I asked her about it, and what she said was, she was the, the girl, let me just put this up real quick. So this is her angry, rebellious child, a little Medusa-like, for those of you who know your mythology. <laughs> and she, had, she said that she, when she was growing up, she had a, uh, an invisible friend who was a black panther. Mm -hmm. And this was when the black panther was protecting her. And I asked her about that, and she said, well, <coughs> and I quote, no one else fucking protected me, so I had to have that. And this is the way that she said that she presented to people for many years of her life. She seemed like this enraged person who was snarky and was like ready to just claw you to death if you said the wrong thing. And we had a really great conversation about this, which was that um, she, she kind of was able to get to a place where this isn't where, who she is anymore. She doesn't need to have this all the time. But she didn't know that yet. So it wasn't until she drew it that she's like, oh, I don't have to do this anymore. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. And she, it kind of was an epiphany for her. She said that this, this one took her hours to do because she was like meticulously, you know, like I have to color in everything and get the, and the blood dropping from the, and it was like this big project of like needing to express this part of herself. And she, basically felt like it was a release to do that. Not everyone will feel that way, but that's how she felt, yeah. So did she do most of the work on her own then? Um, this, the stuff that she, we did, she actually wanted to do at home. Okay. Yeah, so she would do it over, you know, before the next session and bring it in with whatever feeling, this is just the way that she liked to operate. And I was fine with that because she's fine. Do you ask them, like, do they prefer to do it in session or mm -hmm. take it home? I mean, typically I like to do it with them, um, mm -hmm. even though I, I'm sitting for much of the time, but sometimes it feels to them like, oh, they, someone's with them and it feels better that way. And some people just feel like they can really let go and be themselves at home better and be more authentic in what they draw or express. Mm -hmm. Any other questions with this? This is the same person? Yeah. The other? No, it sounds a little bit about people's multiple personalities, and they always have these altars, like they might have the panther protecting them, they might have this. It does sound like that. It's, you know, and that's part of what this whole thing is about, is that, you know, we have these different parts of us with different roles, and for some people it looks like, you know, multiple personalities, mm -hmm. in, and not conscious or not co-conscious, and for some people it's just like, there was a part of me that needed to do this, and that person showed up in these situations, or wanted to, and there's a part of me that was more like this, and that person showed up. 
So uh, you can sort of assess that as you go, what that person is like. Any other thoughts about the angry, rebellious? Good times, right? <laughs> um, so then after that, and again, you know, we're, as we process each, process each of these, it doesn't have to be you finish processing it in one session. It can be, it can take as long as necessary. You can give them assignments to journal about it between sessions, whatever it is that, you know, feels right for what you like to do. Um, and with them, I mean, you know, whatever feels right for you, your relationship. Okay, so the next one is the stubborn, selfish child. And I'm going to read it again because it's better that way. Um, this is covert, passive aggressive, manipulator, game player, sneaky, revengeful, grandiose, can be seductive, promiscuous. I deserve this. Whatever feels good, I'm going to do it. Um, so that's, oh, and let me just say this, both the angry, rebellious child and the stubborn, selfish child are unreasonable, will rationalize to justify behavior, are unwilling to look at the consequences of their actions and refuse to take responsibility for them, usually blame other persons or events, will do whatever they want even though they know their actions will be destructive to themselves and to others, see themselves as a victim but become the victimizer to themselves and or other people. The angry, rebellious child and the stubborn, selfish child are inappropriate, inappropriate actions as a result of the unhealthy combination of the sobbing child, controlling child, and original child. And these need to be eliminated, meaning we want to keep the other ones, but these two we don't want to keep. Which two? The stubborn, selfish, stubborn, and the selfish, next one? And, and the next one, we, we want to get rid of them. These are no longer things that we want them to be turning to or using in their lives. So, oh, you said the controlling, you do? You keep the sobbing child, the controlling child, and the original child. Remember that kind yes. of phallic mm -hmm. thing I drew? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we keep those. We just want to get them nicely balanced. But these other two, the angry rebellious that I just showed and the stubborn selfish, uh, not yeah. necessary anymore. Any other? And do you consider the original child the blank egg before they filled in the traumas, or is the original there, child There will be another drawing. original drawing. Okay. Yeah, an, another drawing. Mm -hmm. So this is the stubborn, selfish child. <laughs> Cannot keep that thing on there. Um, and if you can't see the bottom, maybe you can now. Okay. <laughs> so, asked her about this, and one of the things she said was, well, I look perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and she said it with humor. Um, it was quite clear that there was a really interesting facial expression, snarky. And she also said, like, look how seductive my breasts are. <laughs> They're hypnotic. <laughs> These are the same breasts that started growing when she was eight. So I think that a connection gets made, right? Ah, so what did you do with your breasts that felt traumatic when they started growing? You commandeered them into a seductive tool. So you, you're looking for those connections for them, right? And then down here, I asked her, well, what the hell is going on over there? And she's like, those are all the men I just tore apart. Mm -hmm. This is how she lived her life, like being seductive. And as she said, I fucked everything I could, and I loved it, and I didn't care if they had girlfriends or wives. So this was stubborn selfish, and it was also, in a way, angry rebellious. Mm -hmm. So for her, they're a little fused. But she's an angel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. Last but not least, one of the last things we draw is the original child. And this is one of my favorite things to draw, or have them draw, because it really brings them back to their truth. And what you can say to them is like, look, all of the stuff that you've learned to do to get by in life, none of that's you, is it? And they say, no, it's not. 
These are all your coping skills, but these are not your identity. Your traumas are not your identity. What is your identity? Who are you? We can have a whole existential conversation about that, um, and often do, but just from our perspective today, just saying like, are these you, or is there someone else that's you? Who were you born as, originally? What was your original self? And even though we are almost out of time, I'd really like to show you if I can find it. Um, ah. People yeah. really do okay if it's totally abstract, if they're completely mm -hmm. unable to draw even a person, if it's a mm -hmm. stick figure, whatever, hard to see other whatever they want. So this is what she drew as her original child. Mm -hmm. And boy, this is really different than the thing with the Black Panther and mm -hmm. some of the other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And this was something that took a while for her to do. Like, we actually took a bit of a break. and. Um, she kind of, we processed stuff, she sat with it. Uh, I'm gonna, so you have longer appointments if you mm -hmm. do this in a 15 minute appointment? Depends on the, the client. I mean, a lot of times it really is in our intensive program, so we have more time. Um, but if they really want to do this, sometimes I have people come to that other workshop I'm doing that you guys have the flyer for. You have a four hour time period. We don't do the children in that, we just don't have enough time. Um, but their therapists here know how to do that with them, so they can pick that up. Yeah. What more do you give us guidance for drawing the original child? Oh, yeah. Give me one second. Okay. Um, so the original child is the unfragmented child at conception with innate intelligence, talent, personality, creativity, physical appearance, and the capacity to feel all feelings appropriately and inappropriately. Your true, your soul and your true spirituality is the core of your original child. And the original child is who you were created to be. So let me just do a little note that some people are atheists who do this. And when we talk about the spirituality part, we just say you fill in, you put in there whatever it is you want to put in there. But it's the innate, true, authentic part of yourself connected to the world, connected to others. And we have them just go for it. Whatever it is they want to draw. Sometimes they come in and they're like, yeah, that doesn't feel true. Crumple it up, start fresh. But they want to get something that feels like, they could put it up on their wall and say, that's me. That feels like my true self. All this other stuff doesn't. One of my favorite parts of this process is if we do this right, we put all the eggs up, and we put all the children up in order, and we end with the original child and we have them step back and look at the whole thing. 